In these ecosystems, and this is building on the conversation that was before with the grassland and, and grazing versus fire versus destocking, in those um, brittle tending or seasonally dry environments, what you have is you have rain event comes through and you build up grass. Okay, so the grass will come through, and it's whether it's a 15 inch rainfall zone or a 70 inch rainfall zone, you'll still get a big build up of grass. And then the dry season comes. And what happens in the dry season? If there's no animals there to eat it, it just stands there. It's too dry, it won't decompose. The grass on Hampstead Heath in London in fall will just simply drop over to the ground and decompose and cycle back next year. In these big, big seasonally dry ecosystems, nature evolved a process with the wet environment, the moist environment for microbes on four legs. So these ecosystems have got the big grazing herds. Now, so if you look at them globally, down through here you had a whole lot of um, alpacas and llamas and those sorts of camel types, types through, through South, South America. In Southern Africa you've got the wildebeest and all the springbok, those migratory herds. Through Australia we did have migrating animals prior to first human settlement. Okay, And across the top here, up in America you've got the bison. So there's been big massive herds of animals moving through. Okay. Let's have a look at how, if we're going to have a resilient ecosystem, the first thing to do in terms of ad adapting is to get a sense of what sort of ecosystem we're dealing with, because you can't have the same management if you're in a tropical rainforest or if you're in London with a nice you know, half an inch of rain every, every month for the year as you have in a seasonally dry environment. The Serengeti is probably the last remnant ecosystem that's functioning the way nature intended. There's a couple of factors in there that are worth looking at, okay, because they, this ecosystem is maintained by grazing animals, which is the relevance of it. Three things that are critical that happen across maintaining any of these grazing ecosystems. First thing is, in that picture you will see one large herd of animals. Okay? So it's pretty much everything you need to see about it in that picture, which is you've got one big herd of animals. What are they all doing? They're walking from left to right and they're grazing as they go. Okay? Except for this little bloke down here. Okay, just having a look at the camera. But if you look at it, there are, I don't know, 10, 15,000 animals, they're all doing the same thing, moving from left to right, so there's one big herd of animals. The next thing you'll see is they're constantly moving onto fresh ground. So it's a migration in the, in the uh, Masai Mara and Serengeti in, in Africa. Now from top to bottom is about 1,600 kilometres. Okay, so those animals are going around there on a cyclical basis. Okay. They don't do it with a the rhythm. They don't do it, it's Monday, let's move. Okay? They do it based on a natural cycle. So what you'll know, notice, for example, is at, at the peak of what, the end of the season, they will all be up there. At the other end of it, they'll all be down there. But they will stay there for different times. They'll turn up in different places. They won't go through the same area again. Okay? The final thing you notice is that while they'd like to spread out and relax, they will stay bunched up. Okay, now there was a comment before with, um, from the lady at the back somewhere about the cattle who masticate, they come in and they, they drink around the water hole, they sit down and they relax. Okay, in nature what do they do around a water hole? They take off. And why do they stay bunched up? Because the edges of the herd are dangerous. Okay, so the thing's trying to eat them. Now what's the impact of that in an ecosystem like that? What, what, what does it mean to the grasses when you have one big herd of animals moving through rapidly and staying bunched up? It means they come through and they eat and they dung and they trample and they crunch pretty much everything and they take off and give it a chance to recover. Okay, so there's a natural function involved here. Ideally, if we can head towards that, it makes a bit of sense. So out of this, and it's been the same, at different degrees. So for example, the degree of concentration of the wildebeest on the best parts of the Serengeti is hundreds of times the stocking rate of the Saigai antelope up at the top of Tibet. Okay, you're talking different things, but you've got to balance there. So I'm not saying pack everything together. Okay, it's just understanding the principles. You guys apply the actual how you want to do the thing. What do we do? Now, whether we are ranchers in Longreach or Argentina or whether we are Tanzanian goat herders, with that thing, what's the first thing we do? They stay bunched up because of predators. We don't want them eating our stock, we move the predators away. Once we move the predators away, the animal psychology changes and they start to relax around water holes. Okay, so we do that. Second thing we do is um, we have different herds. So if I'm a Tanzanian goat herder, I want my goats separate to your goats. So we have little mobbers herds. And if we're farmers, we have valid reasons and we sometimes make up reasons to have these cows with that bull and those heifers with that bull and the steers separate to these. And we end up with stuff everywhere. And the next thing we do is we either put a fence around them and stop them moving, or if we're a goat herder, we settle in the village. 
So instead of having a small number of big herds constantly moving onto fresh ground and kept bunched up, humanity, and this is going back for thousands of years, humanity has large numbers of small herds, set stock for long periods in the one area and allowed to spread out. So we've done three things and it's had this, and that's what I said in Manchester is they said that's where the climate change started and human induced. I said it started as soon as we worked out how to light a match or chop down a tree. Okay, we have influenced the climate. That's just reality. All right, this is the bit that scares my kids because Dad starts talking about how grass plants grow. Okay. Um, now, the reason that I find this fascinating is it links into the whole how do we build soil carbon. So we're talking about building soil carbon. Is it a complicated process or is it just a natural process? And it's understanding it. So um, when we're talking about overgrazing, okay, cattle don't graze a paddock and sheep don't graze a pasture. They eat one grass plant, then they eat the next grass plant, then they eat the next grass plant. Okay, so they work their way through animal by animal, plant by plant. Okay, and it's a little bit different thinking about it. So what happens is the grass plant's basically in balance above and below ground. Okay, so a little little root system can't support a great big lot of leaves, little leaf system can't support a great big lot of roots. Okay, so the thing gets into balance. But an experiment they did in, um, in Norway just keeping these things in tubes. And the critical point is, if that's the size of the plant and time, okay, the cropping guy will know this very definitely. When you plant a crop and it starts to grow, it doesn't grow evenly. It doesn't grow the same amount each day. Or does it come out of the ground and then start to do something and then all of a sudden, and then slow down again? <laughs> yep. Yep. So what happens from what you can see here, it actually does that. It's a thing called a sigmoid curve. Okay, 10 minutes, okay. So the thing starts to grow and starts to build through. Now the critical point with that is that, as you can see, the grass plant on the left has been kept clipped, i.e. set stocked, chomp, chomp, chomp. And because of that, it stays short, and the roots have stayed short. Okay, if the plant's allowed to grow and express itself, it ends up like the one on the right. And while it stays in balance, you look at the massive amount of root material that's developed below ground, and remembering that's all carbon sequestered from the atmosphere. Okay. So people say, what you can see when you set stock is you'll see plants like this. Okay, that are chomped out of the middle and that are growing prostate. That's a bunch grass that wants to stand up and it's growing flat to get away from being chomped. And you've got a lot of bare ground in the edge of it. Okay? So people will say, well, we'll get rid of the animals and we'll let the thing grow. Okay, let the grass grow right to the top of it. That's fantastic. That's got to be a better result, doesn't it? Now, we heard before that um, when Stephen was saying with the soil carbon, that when you enclose it and lock animals out, what happened to soil carbon levels? Actually declined. Okay, so you need animals in there to maintain this process. If you don't, what happens is they go over the top of that growth curve and they start to go all grey and senescent. And you see a lot of that country like that. So at the other end of it, it, it looks better for a while and then it starts to grey off and go old and then it starts to collapse again. Okay? You see this classic one that was taken down at Kanamala on a property down there, and you'll see in that photo, you've got one grass plant in the middle that basically has got over the thing and has become unpalatable to the stock. So they haven't touched that one, but the middle of it's died out. Okay, so you see right in the middle, the plant's actually dying from the centre out. And around the edge of the plant, you've got all these little ones that are chomped down. So in the one pasture, you've got overgrazed individual plants and overrested plants. And we're at the wrong end of both bits of it. Okay? So somewhere we can't destock it and we can't, it's what do we do? We need to come back and mimic nature.